Right, so we are now going to have a run through of eight key pieces of information, contextual information that will help you in your exam. This is for OCR, A-Level English Lit, Paper 2, Section B, the comparative paper. And we do 1984 with The Handmaid's Tale. So we'll do 1984 today and then we'll do The Handmaid's Tale on another lesson. And this is a recap of everything that you've done from the first year. Now I'd like to hand over to John Deary, who will take us through some of these key ideas. Thank you, John. Okay, I think that's my cue. So, um, oh, you've nicked my pencil anyway, so I can't write. Um, Julie was saying that uh, you will need more than eight big pieces of uh, EL3 context. But actually, like looking at these eight, if you research into these enough, there's so much there that you will definitely be fine with just these eight. So even just looking at Stalin, he kind of covers so many different parts of 1984. Um, uh, the, the one big clear inspiration is that Uncle Joel Stalin is what he was called in World War II in Britain, where Orwell was living, um, as, as because basically he was allied with the Allies. Um, and so that, that was a rather over-friendly kind of family um, way of referring to a very horrible uh, power-hungry man that Orwell would have been aware of. Um, and then obviously there was Stalin himself had the KGB working for him, who are very clearly allegorical to the thought police. Um, they would disappear people, they would um, kill uh, political dissidents, and, and there was a lot of novelists, should, such as um, Yevgeny Zamyatin, who was a friend of uh, Orwell's, who wrote We, who was actually banished from uh, Soviet Russia by Stalin, he was exiled because he'd written anti-Soviet propaganda, which links to the book that Winston writes. Um, moving a little bit on from that uh, to the, his time in the BBC, very clearly again, it, y you can make lots of arguments about how that is similar to Winston's job at the ministry. Um, not only that, but I think Orwell's wife, Eileen, worked in, was it the Ministry of uh, Facts or the Ministry of Information, I think she worked in, which is <laughs> very, very similar to the Ministry of Truth, um, even just in terms of words uh, that, that, that they've called themselves. And at, during Orwell's time in the BBC, he was aware that a lot of his political opinions wouldn't be broadcast and they would um so he he was a socialist um at a time where communism was kind of considered as well that's the next step from socialism and so socialism was kind of feared a little bit um and so a lot of his socialist messages were taken as kind of pro-communist messages and they were um silenced by the bbc he was only allowed to portray things um, in a certain way and represent facts in a certain way. Um, but Winston's job is closer to, I'll talk about in a minute, the Spanish Civil War experience that he had. Um, he spent a bit of time as a policeman in Burma. He's written a, an article about this. Um, I can't remember what it's called, where he talks about how unethical it is basically for British people to be colonising India um, and basically treating their citizens as lower than human uh, standards um, and also he, he kind of talks about the erosion of the culture and the, the kind of changing a whole uh, culture that existed in India into one that actively supports Britain um, and, and kind of is subservient to Britain and obviously as a policeman there he was enforcing this kind of stuff um, 
and he, he had a real kind of moral aversion to that and he, he ended up quitting his job fairly quickly actually um, and writing Burmese days about the novel um, in the top right that's all well slumped over his desk because he's feeling very ill because he's got TB um, that has been argued by quite a lot of people to be why 1984 is so like cynical in its outlook. I mean, it's you know, it's, it's such a dismal kind of book. But actually, um, there's a, there's a book by Dorian Linsky where he argues that Orwell, for his entire life, had always been ill. He'd always had one thing or another. He'd always had problems. He wasn't expecting to die when he wrote the book. Like a lot of commentators have picked up on the fact that he wrote the book and then he died, basically. So obviously this was written as a kind of last uh, get everything out there before I die messages to the world. But actually Linsky would argue he didn't even think he was going to die. He had two books planned for after this. Um, so the, the TB has less to do with it. Um, socialism, like I've said, Orwell was a very uh, was really really pro socialism, and at the time he thought that socialism was kind of being attacked um, by people on the right who were comparing it with communism, and so he felt like his views were being suppressed by not only by the media but also by everybody else um, in, the, in the country at the time um, and his socialism he, he's arguing basically for the fair treatment of everybody um, which is something that obviously is eroded in um, 1984 so uh, I think I, uh, there's an article by Deutsche or Deutsche I don't know how you pronounce his name um, Isaac um, where he says that um, 1984 is a dark document of disillusionment from every form of socialism and that's just you, you kind of need to be wary of those kind of analyses of 1984 because they're just nigh on impossible to square with Orwell's actual views uh, he was a diehard socialist and died as a hard socialist. Um, <laughs> thanks, Julie. Yeah. No, it's all right. It's all right. You're forgiven. Um, <laughs> right, the big one uh, is his experience of the Spanish Civil War in the next little icon. Um, because he, he talks about in his book, Homage to Catalonia, for the most part, he, for the most part, that book is kind of just talking about the the horrible conditions that he was in in the war and how underprepared his version of the military were. But the interesting bit is right at the end, when he talks about how the Spanish Civil War has been reported throughout history, um, and so he's talking about how the Communist Party, Stalin's Communist Party, were uh, paying off all of the media outside. Um, outside of Spain, basically, because they wanted to have the final say on what had actually happened in the Spanish Civil War. And so, basically, every single account of the Spanish Civil War that existed, he thought was wrong, because it was all biased, it was all complete propaganda. And he, uh, he, he says some kind of quote towards the end, um, where, he's, where he says, basically that I know my account isn't really going to be 100% factually accurate, but I know that it's more accurate than anything else because um, everything else has been taken from um, a very biased viewpoint. Like, uh, I, it, it says at one point that uh, the British media were getting their information about the Spanish Civil War from the Ministry of Propaganda in Spain. So... Very, you know, very obviously, propaganda there is being taken as truth and reported as fact in Britain. Um, World War Two, 
reflects all the all the kind of rationing and, and, and things like that. The country was in a bad state. Everything was being rationed. They didn't really have food. They were being bombed all the time, as are the Proles in 1984 and everybody else actually in 1984. It's been bombed all the time. There's a constant war going on in the background. Um, everything was a bit uh, gloomy and it, it, it did just kind of that's the inspiration for those shortages of razor blades and things like that. Um, and then Hitler. He was pretty, pretty bad guy. He's uh, <laughs> been taken as the basis for a heck of a lot of the uh, kind of fascist policies in 1984. Um, so the Hitler Youth Movement is is an obvious one. Um, you know, very clear inspiration for the uh, Parsons kids, although actually probably the Boy Scouts at the time in Britain uh, were, were, were doing very similar things, uh, promoting conscription and patriotism and national values and things like that. Um, Hitler himself um, can be kind of... I mean, Hitler and Stalin very closely resemble the actual physical description of Big Brother, the big moustache and the, uh, he's constantly watching you and things like that. Um, and both Hitler and Stalin had torture programs um, where they would uh, get people in camps and, and basically try and convert them to... I mean, Stalin more so than Hitler. Stalin would use a heck of a lot of... Uh, torture it with the main aim to break people internally and make them supporters of the state uh, which is I mean he was doing room 101 <laughs> before it was in 1984 um, I think that's it's more or less mm -hmm. my rambling finished is, for the is context there else just that you know might not have been triggered by the sheep. Well, there's a heck of a lot of modern context, unfortunately, for, the, for 1984 that's going on now. It's just vague things. Um, surveillance capitalism um, is a big thing these days. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people like Shoshana Zuboff are talking about, she came up with the term surveillance capitalism, and it's basically uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon are deliberately like that's how they make their money is knowing every move that you make being able to predict your every move uh knowing what you're going to buy they track everything they put in cameras in your houses uh google released uh, a thermostat that had a microphone in it and they didn't tell anybody that it had a microphone in it and then like some guy just took it apart uh, and he was like Oh, there's a, there's a microphone in this that's not in any of the schematics that are available online. And Google were like, oh, whoops. So, you know, big big Bezos is watching you uh, if Big Brother isn't necessarily in the, in the real world. Amazon, Facebook, Google, they're massive for surveillance uh, in, the, in the modern world. They're really big. Um, and also modern context, uh, China, they're doing the same surveillance state, basically, uh, and they're also uh, they, they've got the oh what are they called the 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 correctional camps for the Uyghur Muslims, and they're putting people in there. And what actually goes on in the camps is uh, it's been released in a documentary recently, a Panorama documentary, uh, where they found a document from the Chinese government, which is detailing how these camps should operate and it's basically like 1984 the hand or the, the handmaid's tale as as kind of a thing it's um they follow all of them around they, everybody has a set time to wake up uh to you know go you only ever have two minutes to go to the bathroom you have to eat at the exact same time as everybody else you have set times you do things at the exact same time as everybody else. Everything's on a schedule. And if you miss something by a couple of minutes, which would be quite hard to do anyway because you're always being followed by armed guards, uh, you get attacked with a like an electric stick in the back of the head. Uh, and then you've got to kind of uh, 